Good morning. Today is September the 21st, 2018. We are at the Swanee County Museum in what was the Atlantic Coastline Freight Station. The museum is located on Ohio Avenue near the former Live Oak City Hall, one block north of downtown. I am Janet Ayers from the Swanee County Historical Commission. I am assisted by Dale Baker, a member of the Swanee County Historical Commission, and videographers Stephen Snipeman and Christian Rodriguez of Do Good Media. This morning we are interviewing William H. Williams, Jr. as a member of the Swanee County Historical Commission as a part of our oral project Mr. Williams, we appreciate you taking time from your busy schedule to participate in this project. I, will, I am sure your insights into local history will be of great value for generations to come. Please give us your personal information. Well, my full name is William Henry Williams, Jr. I'm 83 years old. I was born June the 25th, 1935. My parents were Susie Lord Williams and William Henry Williams. I was uh, attended uh, schools in Swanee County uh, for a short time at FSU, and uh, then in, in the Army. And now I'm retired from the telephone company. I had started off as uh, North Florida Telephone Company, which was a locally owned telephone company. The Wettstein family had the major stock, uh, but it was uh, also public. There was stock owned by the public. And it was sold uh, to Midcontinent Telephone out of Hudson, Ohio. Later, they merged with Allied Telephone Company out of Little Rock, Arkansas, and became Alltel Corporation. Alltel then split into the cell phone company and retained that name and the spinoff for the landline company was Windstream which is the telephone company in our area today. The uh, Altel was later bought by um, a group of investors and they sold to Verizon so the Land, uh, the cell phone part now is Verizon, and the landline is still Windstream. Uh, could we regress or digress? <laughs> uh, where were you born? Chipley, Florida, in and Washington County, which is uh, west of Tallahassee. Okay. And who were your parents? Uh, William Henry Williams and Susie Lord Williams. And I had one brother who's deceased. And, uh, what are some of your earliest memories with your family? Well, I just uh, don't have many early remembrances. We uh, moved here when I was two, and I'm, we built a home on Swanee Avenue where I still live, and uh, that was in 1938. And I don't remember anything prior to that home. I, we lived in other places in Live Oak, but I don't remember that specifically. I knew where they were because Mother t told me, but um, one place was on Pine Avenue. Uh, it's now, I think, um, used to be the Doris Moore's house, but I'm not sure who owns it now. And one was on Seminole, at the corner of Meadow, I think, or maybe Westmoreland, I don't remember. But anyway, my earliest memories are of that house, or the house I live in now. And, uh, and that house is on Swanee? Swanee Avenue. And I, I do go, I did remember going to uh, Nanny's Kindergarten, and that's really before, uh, at that time, they didn't have public school kindergartens. You had uh, private kindergartens, and it was probably half day uh, nursery school, really, with uh, 
but we played games and, and uh, I had friends in that kindergarten class that are still with us today and good friends. Uh, what type, types of games did you play then? Well, in, in kindergarten, I don't remember particularly. I think like, what was it, may I? When you took two steps and you had to say may I before you could take them in uh, dodgeball and, and kickball. And uh, uh, I don't think we played any football at that time. That was a little bit too early for us. But uh, um, I remember playing, they, we had a instrument called a tonette. So we had a tonette band. And so that was a music learning experience. Um, what did you play? The tonette. <laughs> the tonette. You That's played the tonette? Okay. I, everybody had the same instrument. And that was, was similar a, to a? Uh, recorder. Recorder. I think is what they uh, call them now. Uh, you mentioned uh, the other day that you had some very special memories of a grandparent. Oh yes, my mother's parents were very close to us because they lived near to, in Tallahassee. Uh, my father's parent, uh, my grandmother, his mother died before I was born. So I knew his daddy who lived to be 94, but he was an older man by the time I came along and, and didn't have much of a experience with him. But mother's parents were very kind, generous people and I enjoyed being with them grandmother in particular she uh, didn't mention the other day but the, my first symphony we walked from her house to the fsu ruby diamond auditorium for the symphony and that was my first experience with a big orchestra and i did remember that later then too i remember she would she never learned to drive so she would come on the greyhound bus to live oak and i would join her and we would go to town to jacksonville and change buses and go on to daytona beach and we stayed in a rooming house across from the band shell. And uh, of course, there was no air conditioning at that time, so you had a little fan in the room that would try to keep you cool, but didn't work, as I remember. I don't remember anything about bathrooms or anything like that. I'm sure they had them in the house, but I just don't remember that part. But I remember the rooms, and, and uh, of course, other people were there too. And, uh, but that was a fun memory of her. And, uh, and you said she is from Tallahassee? She, she was li They lived in Tallahassee at that time. Uh, early on, when mother was in high school, uh, they lived in a small town in Georgia, out of Pulgas, Georgia. And, um, but she, so they didn't have a, a senior high school. So she lived with friends in Madison, Florida, and graduated from Madison High School when she was 15 years old. And uh, they, in the meantime, had moved to Tallahassee to become, I guess, residents of Florida so they wouldn't have to pay an out-of-state tuition. But anyway, she moved to Tallahassee then with her parents and went to Florida State College for Women at that time and graduated when she was 19. And she went on to, uh, for her first job, went to Chipley, Florida to uh, teach and met my father. They married in 28, in 1928. Uh, my, Could you give us the names of your grandparents? The, uh, my grandfather, my father's father was John Wesley Williams and his wife was Mary Elizabeth. She was a Harold before she married. And uh, my mother's parents were Eldridge Redding Lord and Susie Ethel Griffin Lord. She was um, from, they were both their, my grandfather Lord's family was in Jefferson County, Florida, and um, Thomas County, Georgia, sort of up on the line. I think they moved, probably the state line moved, they didn't, but. Uh, they were recorded in both Georgia and Florida. Uh, Could you share with us, please, some of your memories, early memories, uh, laundry, cooking, things that are, are much different now than they were then? Well, Grandmother Lord had a uh, 
large house and a big cook, and she had a wood stove and an electric stove, and she had an ice box, which the ice man delivered the ice every day, and then she had a refrigerator also. But I think it was probably converting from the old to the new, but she had both at the same time. Uh, the our laundry, we always had electric appliances, but uh, the laundry, it, uh, when I was a small child, was uh, actually picked up by a black woman that uh, would take them home and, and do the washing and bring them back. Uh, of course, the dry cleaning was done, the dry cleaning uh, cleaners, but uh, uh, the, of course, uh, modes of transportation uh, changed quite a bit. Uh, early on, I remember uh, people living in the country would, would come in on their uh, buckboards or carriages or whatever uh, to shop on Saturdays. Uh, they parked behind uh, oh, well, the, what would be Fleets at that time and Gibbs and, and uh, Fleets and uh, the surprise store, which would be on Warren Street now. And uh, down, I guess, the next block, too, um, behind what was then. Uh, Dupree's or Gilmore's uh, stores and uh, when Dixie was there on the corner of Pine and oh, on, and Howard. Uh, Wasn't there a drugstore on that end? There was a drugstore now where one of the parks are, is. It uh, was the Live Oak, I believe it was Live Oak Drugstore and it was owned by the Harvards. But they were not pharmacists so uh, uh, Mr. Washington was the pharmacist. And um, later on, um, Sherwood Harvard sold out to, uh, I believe, Mr. Culpepper, and they had it. And then he, I think, sold to John Chambliss, who had it at, uh, till it. Um, we talked earlier about Piggly Wiggly and some of well, the Well, that was my first job, was at Piggly Wiggly. And it was though at the old building where the jail is now, um, approximately. Um, I, I guess the, the street is Wilbur Street and, and, and Pine. That that was at the corner of Wilbur and Pine. And uh, I was a bag boy. And at that time, we carried groceries out to people that were parked way off. <laughs> and they'd have big, huge bags of groceries that I'd have to carry. I didn't like that job too much. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you mentioned also when you were young, um, your job farming. Well, I, I was <laughs> actually, it was a one day experience handing tobacco for Mr. John Cameron. His sister-in-law was a next door neighbor and she just was babysitting me, I think, and took me out there. But he was paid, he paid me 50 cents. And that's really about the only farming experience I ever had. Uh, Could you talk a little more about school in your later years? Well, uh, <clears throat> school was, uh, uh, I always enjoyed school. I was not a very good student, but uh, it was a fun time. Uh, got lots of good friends, uh, good teachers. I especially remember a few. I started the first grade at uh, what the, where the First Baptist Church uh, Family Life Center is, there was a building and it housed first through the seventh grade, I think, or eighth grade. And uh, we were in the basement room uh, and I had Nettie Basin was my teacher. Uh, during that year, they finished what became Nettie Basin School. And so I went over there for the second grade had Gwendolyn Bozeman was my second grade teacher. And then the third grade was there. And then the fourth grade, we went back over to what became the junior high building. And um, the, uh, I think fourth, fifth, and sixth grades were on the main floor and the seventh and eighth grades were on the upstairs floors. Then after eighth grade, we moved across the street to the high school. 
and had uh, was in high school nine through twelve. I graduated in 1953. Was that the Metcalf building? I think maybe that's what they referred to it. Yes, and I don't know where that name came from. And you were in a band in high school. I was in the band, uh, in the key club, and uh, student council. Could you tell us a little bit about your junior senior prom? Well, it was an exciting time of year. The juniors actually entertained the seniors uh, with a banquet that was held at the Masonic Lodge building, which was du on the corner of uh, Ohio and Duval. Uh, it has since burned, I believe, and had been uh, demolished. But uh, after the banquet, the, the uh, sophomore boys served and it was an honor to be asked to serve and uh, because you couldn't go to the dance afterwards. <laughs> but the, uh, then the dance was held at the armory upstairs, which is now where the uh, uh, Swanee Valley Genealogy Building is actually next door. Between that and Mazelle's was the armory. Uh, but it was a very formal occasion. Everybody dressed up, had the girls had corsages. And it always started with a grand march, they called it. And that was led by the uh, officers, the junior and senior class presidents and their dates. And uh, then everyone followed behind that and it was just a pomp and circumstance sort of move that, that then broke up and, and enjoyed uh, dancing after that. After the uh, back, backing up a bit, um, when you were 13, you could go to Teen Town, which is actually was held at the Masonic Lodge also. And uh, it was chaperoned by parents. It was just a volunteer thing. I don't think there was any dues to go or anything like that, but they had uh, jukeboxes and you played songs to dance in. At that time, we were more of a big band era and rock and roll didn't come in until the mid to late 50s, I think, as I remember right. Um, so we were dancing still to Benny Goodman and Tommy Dorsey and Harry James and things like that. So, was, but we had a good time. Did you also have sock hops or? Well, after the games, after, after ball games, during football seasons, uh, we'd go to the armory and supposedly have sock hops because you weren't supposed to wear shoes on the, on the uh, basketball court floor mm -hmm. because it was shiny. and and didn't want to uh, be scuffed. But so we were supposed to take off our shoes and just, just dance in our socks. But that was just entertainment after, keep us off the street, I think. Uh, did you want to tell us some about your college years? Not much, <laughs> I didn't, I wasn't there that long. But uh, I did, my friend George Carver uh, and I, uh, George is one of our kindergarten friends, and we're still friends to this day. We both joined the fraternity, Alpha Tau Omega, and uh, both played bridge that we had learned in high school from a friend's grandmother. And uh, so we uh, entered the bridge tournament and actually won the Southeastern Bridge it's called Collegiate Bridge Tournament, I think is what it was called. Big, big line, but anyway, we didn't get any gold stars or anything, but we did get a certificate, I think. I think that's wonderful. Uh, changing the subject for a minute, how did the Great Depression affect your family and this community? <clears throat> well, my family was, I guess, uh, my father, started uh, dental school at, uh, I think, Atlanta Dental College at that time, which was later became Emory. Uh, but because of the depression, he had to drop out and uh, didn't have much luck with jobs. So he took a job in Live Oak as a policeman. It's the reason we ended up in Live Oak. <laughs> but uh, later on, he became an independent insurance agent and uh, mother taught school uh, here and uh, had started in Chipley. But she taught here at, uh, she started in 1947, I guess, when my brother went off to school. 
So, uh, get back to the question you'll have to remind The impact me. that... <laughs> oh, okay. The impact yeah. that, that... I, I uh, rambled on. Oh, but the uh, <clears throat> But the... Uh, uh, that's the only effect that I know of because after I was born in 35, the Depression was at an end then. It was, it was, we were beginning to come out of it. They remember the war really uh, began the Great Recovery, the Second World War. And I remember, I think I remember hearing it uh, on Sunday afternoon when they announced that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. That may have been made up. Uh, I do remember the end of the war when the fire whistle blew and all the announcing and we didn't know what was wrong with the fire and then finally everyone realized it was signaling the end of the Second World War. And we had been in school up that four years. We started in, in 40 and or 41 and ended in 45. So all the time, we didn't know any difference. We all thought the world was at war all the time, you know. So uh, peace came and then I think, I think after the war, the recovery was extreme then. The veterans came back and they started going to college and, and it really changed the world. Please tell us a little bit about <clears throat> how um, during the war, Live Oak responded to that. Were there war bonds? Or oh, absolutely. In fact, I brought some, and I was—I don't. I'm sure you can't get these, but this was stamp books, and you—you. You, uh, this is a twenty-five. This is a ten cent, and you put bought stamps for ten cents each, and when you uh, collected. That filled up the book with eighteen dollars and seventy cents. You could change this for a twenty-five dollar war bond, which, and then this is the twenty-five cent book. It's the same deal though. You filled it up, and then when you reached eighteen seventy-five, I guess it is. Yeah, eighteen seventy-five. You would trade it for a twenty-five dollar war bond. That's a real treasure. <laughs> and th this time. Um, Two, there was gas rationing, or there was a rationing of a lot of things. But this happens to be mother's uh, gas registration and, and tickets. And I don't know what these are for. There are two kinds. There's an A17 and a B7 stamp. And I, I guess you, when you bought gas, you had to turn them in or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, these are old things I found yesterday while looking for something else. <laughs> so. Anyway, I remember that, and I remember buying, getting sugar in a five, uh, I'm not going to say five pound, a large croaker sack from a uncle that uh, was the superintendent of the uh, farms prison system in, in Belle Glade, Florida. And they had cane down there, and they would make sugar, but it was like brown sugar, and it was very moist. So I remember keeping it in a pan so the moisture would not get out, it would leak out. But it, it was the look like, and the texture, as I remember, was like uh, brown sugar now. Um, we had a next door neighbor that was the manager of the A&P store. And we never could buy anything illegally or anything like that, but he would drop hints that he was getting in, say, real sugar or whatever was scarce, I don't remember, but uh, hard to buy items. And uh, so, mother could get there to buy it when it was in, <laughs> which was a help, I remember. We had uh, cooks all the time when mother and daddy were working. And uh, when I was very young and we first moved in the house, we had a live-in lady that uh, stayed to take care of me and my brother and cook and clean and everything like that. But I think probably, uh, after the war, things she got a better job and moved on. So, <clears throat> moving on, could you please tell us what you remember about the Ruby McCullum trial? Well, it was a it was an exciting time actually. But uh, I remember being in church when the uh, a member who was also a policeman came in and and announced at the end of the service that. Dr. Adams had been killed. Everyone assumed that it was in a car accident because he was known to be a reckless driver and having to make 
calls out in the county, he would drive too fast. So uh, being a Sunday morning later, we found out and, uh, that he had been slain by a black woman, Ruby McCollum. But uh, I remember also that uh, mother was a friend of Mrs. Adams and, and uh, she and um, another lady, you were, uh, who was that? Uh, Sarah Rogers. Uh, where I think about the first ones to get to her, to Miss Adams' house, and uh, I could hear her crying. Of course, she was very upset, Mrs. Adams, because she had, I think maybe the year before, had lost her only son in a car accident in Texas. Uh, so I think she probably thought this was the end of the world. <laughs> she later married Merle Jernigan, whose son had married her daughter. So it was an interesting <laughs> concept. She married her own. Could we please go back just for a minute to uh, that time <coughs> and uh, discuss Another. what it was like here during that period? Well, the, of course, there was a lot of unrest that day, and I'm sure for several days and during the trial. But that day, I have friends. Uh, Ruby Johnson, whose daughter Pat was a good friend of mine. And her older sister was uh, Helen, and uh, Helen had married Harley Brown. It was here because he was in the service. But the, the former cook, a uh, black lady, and her family came to the Johnson residence. They were petrified to stay in the black quarters where they were living. And uh, so they came for to, to get out of that, and the Johnsons put them up and made them stay with them during this time, uh, which I thought was very, very nice. And at that time, of course, the race problem was bad, was bad. Uh, could you tell us a little <coughs> bit about uh, the trial itself? I the don't defense actually, attorney or? The, uh, the only thing I know about that was later, uh, at uh, FSU, a good friend of mine, Joanne, Joanne Cundiff, uh, had a good friend who was a canon, and her, her father was the defense attorney for Ruby McCollum, or at least his firm was, I guess he was too. But uh, the uh, trial was, was uh, presided by Judge uh, Hal Adams who was not related to that Adams family. He was from Mayo. But uh, I, of course, did not attend any of the trial. Uh, so I, I really don't know anything about it. And you mentioned the Ku Klux Klan? Well, shortly after that, between, I think he was killed in 51, wasn't he? Something like that. And uh, after that, either 52 or maybe 53, uh, the Ku Klux Klan had a march through downtown Live Oak. Uh, I don't know where it started, but they marched north of Ohio Avenue. And a good friend of mine was Adrian Gibbs, so, and they lived on Ohio Avenue. So we darkened the sun porch and watched the parade from the sun porch. Quite a crowd of us. How the downtown area has changed. <laughs> Is one of the things you mentioned. Well, earlier. yes, it has changed a great deal because the uh, at the Pine and, and um, Howard Street now are three, three uh, corners are, are parks, and of course they were all thriving businesses at that time. Um, growing up, in fact, downtown we had dry goods stores, all kind of independently owned stores. There were no chain stores that I know of except the grocery store um, and Piggly Wiggly and the A&P, uh, perhaps the Western Auto. But actually it's a franchise situation so it was owned by local people. Um, we had a lot of business and, and uh, I, during high school, worked for Gibbs Company. Uh, it was a department store. They had everything, women's clothing, men's, children's, girls, boys, uh, uh, farm uh, clothes, uh, 
dungarees, uh, bib overalls, anything that anybody, luggage, can't think of, it, of everything. But anyway, it was, had a lot of different items. And I enjoyed it very much. It was, I was just a gopher. I would come in after school, wash the display windows and sweep the sidewalk and go to the post office and uh, work till five five thirty, I think, five thirty. And uh, then uh, Saturdays started at eight o'clock and worked till there was nobody on the street. And Mr. Gibbs would go out front, in fact, and look down the street. And if there wasn't anybody on the street, he'd say, well, let's close up. You know, <laughs> but there were people that came downtown just to be downtown on Saturday the, to see the crowd and visit. Of course, that's all gone now. We hardly know each other next door. But uh, it, it was a it was a good time. During tobacco season was a real highlight. We had uh, out of town people came in for the. I think it was about a month. I think four weeks about. Uh, when they had sales for the tobacco. And uh, so people from North Carolina, and Tennessee, and Kentucky would all come down. They had a lot of young people that would come with them that were off out of school. So we had a lot of good friends that came back after year after year to, uh, and we, we became good friends. Um, one that I remember specifically, of course, we knew, I knew them before that was the the Hill boys, they were Jimmy and, and uh, Buddy Hill, but their grandmother was uh, Miss Kate Hare. And uh, they lived in uh, North Carolina, but it, their daddy worked the tobacco market, and so they would come here and to Thomasville. He went over to Thomasville after we grew up, and uh, Miss Kate would ask me to drive her to Thomasville to see them. And so I did a couple of times during the time. But we always had, and they had street dances, uh, which was held on Warren Street uh, on Saturday nights. And it would be the round and square dances. So they would have a square dance caller and people would, would do square dances and then they'd have round dances, which was just like a regular dance. It wasn't just, uh, <clears throat> but. Uh, they had a tobacco queen, mm -hmm. Mary Nancy Bass Macmillan uh, was, I think, the first tobacco queen. I'm not sure about that, but she may not have been the first one, but she was one. She's the mother of uh, uh, the Macmillan boy that's a pharmacist at Winn-Dixie, mm -hmm. his mother. And, uh, where, did the, the, where did the tobacco buyers stay? They actually stayed in the hotel and in, they rented rooms. Uh, we had a couple that lived, that rented uh, our spare bedroom uh, for that, for the market. Uh, it was the man worked and she just came with him. They didn't have children. So she, she traveled with him from market to market. What they would do at that time was the, the Live Oak was the first market to open. We had the earliest tobacco. Then they'd go into Georgia and then to South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia as they uh, tobacco matured in that area. Of course, now we have so few tobacco farmers. In fact, I think probably only one or two that uh, rent uh, land to grow tobacco. And then at some point they moved up to Canada? Yeah, I think they did end up in Canada, yes. A lot of them left, in fact, went from here to Canada. I'd forgotten that, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. But it was an exciting time, summertime. You said that some of them stayed at the Swanee Hotel? Yes, they did. <laughs> Do you have? Them? I had a personal experience with the Swanee Hotel. Uh, the owner's wife was Miss Ruth Stever, and she had a hatchery, chicken hatchery, on Pine Street, where now the uh, uh, supervisor of elections office is in that general area. And, uh, but she later in life married Mr. Hall, who owned the hotel and moved into the hotel. She liked her little toddy in the afternoon, and she always would ask you if you wanted to have a cup of tea with her, which meant not, a t not tea, <laughs> but anyway. But other than that, I did have a cousin, my mother had a first cousin who came and worked for the Atlantic Coastline Railroad. 
and uh, she lived at the hotel. And uh, do, during the 50s, uh, they were working on the Hal W. Adams Bridge to, to Lafayette County. And this man that was the engineer or supervisor or something worked for the bridge company and he lived in the hotel. Well, they met and married and lived happily ever after. <laughs> So that was fun. Daddy was uh, my my mother's cousin, was a flamboyant lady. Very kind. I loved her a lot. One thing I used to stay with her at the hotel, which was an adventure. If mother and daddy were going to somewhere, and uh, I'd go stay with her, and uh, she bought my first wristwatch for my thirteenth birthday, and it was from Ross Jewelry which at that time was across the street from the hotel. Uh, Linda Riggins is the granddaughter of Mrs. Ross, and uh, she's still here, but uh, yeah, I have wonderful memories of Betty. She had, she came to town with two fur coats, <laughs> one a leopard and one was a mink. and. Uh, Mother and Daddy went to some convention in New York, and uh, Mother wore that mink coat up there. <laughs> she was very dressed up. <laughs> but yeah, it was, fun. it was fun. It was fun growing up here. It was. Uh, we had a lot of good friends. Uh, memories are fleeting, but uh, still, still have some good friends. Margaret Carmichael was a schoolmate. Betsy Crabs Birch was a schoolmate. Uh, Dean Lewis, who's passed on. Uh, we just had a good group of, of friends at that, yes. that, that time. And, uh, that is so Mr. Baker, do you have any questions you would like to ask Mr. Williams? Uh, yeah, I was going to check. Um, when you mentioned that you played an instrument in the band, was you in the band in high school for four years? And what instrument did you play? I was in the band for actually six years. We started in the seventh grade and went through through high school. Uh, I was I held a clarinet. I'm not saying that I was good enough to play it, but <laughs> anyway, I was in the band for, for six years. Uh, we had a good experience with that. Uh, when I was in high school, a seventh or eighth grade, uh, Mr. Stocking came to, to uh, Swanee County as the band director, and he had a a friend who was uh, involved with the Mardi Gras parade in, in New Orleans. And so the band, we raised money and rode school buses to New Orleans to participate in two parades. Those parades were at night and they had men carrying torches to light the parade. And uh, of course they put off a soot and we would come in black faced <laughs> at the end of the parade. <laughs> Um, I have another question. When you mentioned your mother was a school teacher here in Swanee County, um, what school was she at and what subjects did she teach? What grades? When she first started uh, teaching in, in Live Oak, she was the uh, general science and home economics. And they had a, the reason is the, the uh, Catherine Pryor was the home economics teacher and they were having more girls interested in home ec at that time. So they were signing up, so she did both. And then I think maybe only a year that she taught general science. Then they had enough girls that wanted to home ec that they uh, had two teachers. Um, she, she worked until from 47 to 72, I think is what, about 25 years or so. Um, also, you mentioned that you were in the military and that you were stationed in Germany. What part of Germany were you in? And were you in a infantry or armored division? I was in the army in the infantry. Uh, we were at, well, stationed in Bamberg, Germany. And at that time, there was a replacement. Uh, the uh, uh, division that had been in Germany, I think since the war ended, that uh, in the occupation, uh, the, so they were trying to get a whole division together to replace them. So uh, we were told 
the minute we took the oath that we were going to Germany as soon as we finished our training. We were with the same people that we trained with for the whole, we had the same officers, enlisted men, everything was the same for the two years, except for those particular people that were maybe taken out to, that were mechanics and they were put in the uh, motor pool and things like that. But for, for the most part, uh, we were with the same group for, for the whole two years that I was in. So I attained the high rank of private first class. Mr. Williams, thank you very much for sharing the story of your life. We appreciate the insights and history you have shared. Thank you.